So good morning and, and welcome everybody to uh, CSIS. My name is Carl Meacham and I'm the director here of the Americas program. And I'm really glad that you could join us uh, this morning uh, for our conversation with Miriam Luisa Leiva Viamonte. Uh, as you all know, she's a human rights activist and journalist uh, from Cuba. And today we'll be discussing recent changes in Cuba, the island's role in the Western Hemisphere and the trajectory of US-Cuban relations. Uh, this is a particularly uh, exciting uh, event and time to have uh, my medium with us here today. Um, she's visiting with folks in the administration and in, in the Congress. Um, I'll leave it up to her to talk about her views on recent changes in Cuba, uh, but I'd like to give you a brief view of where Cuba is now and what we might be able to expect from the island in the near future. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, Fidel Castro formally handed over the country's leadership to his brother, uh, Raul, in 2008. And since then, Raul has enacted a series of reforms, most of which focused on Cuba's economy. Uh, more than at any point since the Castro's took power, Cuba's economy is open to foreign investment. For the first time, Cubans have some limited access to the internet, for example. Uh, but even though these changes are not insignificant, they are modest. Uh, but it's pivotal that we recognize the, the limited scope of these reforms. Uh, they are economic, not political or structural. The government is still miles away from being a democracy. Diversity of political voices is still strictly limited, with frequent repression of the political opposition to Castro's government. The respect for even the most basic human rights remains tenuous at best. Uh, and it's in that context that the U.S. must, must constantly reevaluate its own history with the island. Um, I'm, I'm very excited also to have Tomas Bilbao here, the executive director uh, for the Cuba Study Group, who's also a uh, senior advisor, or senior uh, fellow here at uh, CSIS. And he's going to be doing uh, some of the uh, question and answer period. He's going to help me moderate this wonderful session today. Uh, thankfully, uh, Medium is here to shed some light on some of the issues that I mentioned today, particularly uh, the country's current environment for human rights and civil liberties, and to address the challenges we face as we move, for as we move forward with this relationship. Uh, a couple of details on Medium. Uh, she's a Cuban independent journalist and human rights activist. Once a diplomat for Cuba, Medium Luisa is intimately familiar with the inner system of Castro's government. Uh, preoccupied with the situation of human rights, uh, she then became one of the founders of the movement Damas de Blanco, Ladies in White, to advocate for amnesty of political prisoners, earning them the Andrei Sakharov Award for Freedom of Thought from the European Parliament in uh, 2005, uh, the 2006 Human Rights Award from, the Human Rights, from Human Rights First, and the Human Rights Award from the Cuban Hispanic Foundation in 2004. As a journalist, Medium Luis's works have been published in the International Herald Tribune, the Miami Herald, El Nuevo Herald, newspapers and magazines in Sweden, France, Slovakia, and posted uh, on Salon.com, Cubanet, Cuba Encuentro, Liberal, or Libertad, uh, Digital, etc. In 2004 and 2005, her work as a journalist earned her the member of the jury of the Reporters Without Frontiers Prize. Uh, the usual uh, rules apply for today. Uh, we're on the record, we're webcasting, so hello to all of you guys who are watching. Uh, this, uh, this event today. Uh, and for the q and I would ask that you wait for one uh, of my uh, members of my staff to get a microphone to you and please identify yourself and ask uh, a question. Um, we're also going to be having Tomas uh, run uh, the Q&A uh, session. Uh, first, um, we're going to have uh, Medium, of course. Uh, and um, without further ado, Medium, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sure. Well, hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you because, uh, <clears throat> you know, Cubans, we cannot uh, travel abroad. Well, now we are starting to be able to do so. And, of course, I was looking forward to meeting here with you, and thank you for having me here. And, of course, uh, getting to know more about the United States and about Washington and about everything. Um, well, uh, Situation in Cuba has changed. It's true that these changes are very limited, <clears throat> that um, they're in, uh, they don't 
uh, go forward very easily, very fast, and, and sometimes you feel that they're going backwards. But uh, the situation is quite different uh, of what it was in, let's say, before Fidel Castro's uh, illness in 2006. And I think that is, this is due to the <clears throat> very difficult economic, mainly economic situation that uh, the government has. Fidel, uh, Raul Castro um, inherited uh, a Cuba in, uh, almost in bankruptcy, it decapitalized uh, all the industries in infrastructure, and uh, he hasn't been able to move the economy to uh, produce, to export, and it's mainly importing. And uh, since uh, Venezuela is each time weaker, it's, there are more problems, and Cuba <coughs> um, lost the, the, the support of the Soviet Union and all the communist bloc, but uh, replaced it with uh, Venezuela, mainly not only the oil, but exporting uh, services that, it, uh, that is mainly doctors and, and other personnel. And that's the main uh, income that the Cuban government has. Then if, well, a situation in, in Venezuela worsen or changes and, and they have to cut, uh, there would be in the first place a problem with the oil, with the, that it's not only for Cuba's needs, but also the Cuban government exports some of it. And may, may perhaps um, also these uh, services uh, from people who are working there would be caught or might suffer. Then <clears throat> uh, Raul Castro has been trying to get other uh, ways of uh, uh, means, uh, economic means, but uh, they don't have any uh, savings, they don't have money to invest, and they need um, a foreign investment. That's why there is a new law. It's less restricted than the previous one, but anyway, um, there may, might not be yet enough uh, guarantees for, for the investors. Uh, the government is saying that they need $2.5 billion yearly in investments. And you can think that they, if they're starting now, they won't get any benefit if they get some in three, five years. Uh, that's from the economic point of view, more or less, um, very fast, <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, um, some economists think uh, that uh, the situation in Cuba, if uh, Venezuela is caught, it's not going to be as uh, harsh as it was in the 90s when uh, the Soviet Union was lost. But uh, at that time, uh, Cuba had a better uh, industrial um, basis. Um, also, they, they, they had reserves from all the imports from the Soviet Union. <clears throat> and uh, wages uh, had a little more value. People could live a little better. The situation in general was uh, better than it is now. Now everything is crumbling in Cuba. The government doesn't have any um, resources. So if uh, there is a, a, a cut, sudden cut from Venezuela, it, um, that's, I, I think that the, the, the country, the people are going to suffer more. Although some say, well, now uh, Cuba produces 50% of the uh, oil that it uh, needs, but anyway, uh, Raul Ca uh, Fidel Castro um, proclaimed the um, power revolution, the elect electricity the revolution, and then he made, for instance, he made all people uh, cook and, and use only electricity. So imagine if there, is a, there are blackouts any time. You can see many, many other things that could happen. Well, that's from that point of view. Uh, also, uh, they, are, are, they have uh, been building this Mariel port and the special economic zone uh, with the Brazilians. Of course, this is looking uh, towards uh, the United States. Uh, but again, the port isn't finished. There is a great competition with other ports in the, in the, this, uh, around the Caribbean and, and even the American coast. And also, um, the, this economic um, free zone is supposed to work when the foreign investors come. But if, it depends on foreign investment. So the, I think that the situation is quite complicated. And uh, the, the, um, the Cuban government is tied, Raul Castro is tied with uh, these reforms. 
they say they are, he knows that he has to uh, bring about reforms and changes, but again, they are very afraid of them. Because uh, this can also mean that people feel uh, more independent and they start asking for uh, political uh, freedoms. And also, uh, because they don't still feel safe, they, they say, well, if there are changes in, that's what I think, no? Maybe if, if, that, if there are changes in Cuba, people will start asking for justice. Then, well, uh, in regarding human rights, they're still very uh, tight. Uh, there's a little opening in this, um, uh, allowing travels and, and Cubans to, to travel abroad. It's very important that uh, Cubans, uh, uh, Cuban Americans are traveling, and this is in, on the part of the um, United States government that has allowed uh, Cubans to, to go more, um, and some Americans too, to go more to Cuba, and of course the remittances from the relatives, and this has been very important because this has made a, a, good, a great change in <clears throat> not only the, um, the lives uh, the, if the, with economic means of the Cubans, of many Cubans, but also uh, from the point of view that, that you exchange views, that you learn what is going on. So many travels, travel to the United States, and it's helping um, opening Cubans' uh, minds. It's helping uh, op be op more open, uh, uh, talk more, and of course, know things that the Cuban government has always been uh, prohibiting. And even you can even learn here, I don't know, a gadget that you didn't even know that it existed. It's, it's so wide, it's so many things. And also Americans going to the United States. Of course, there is repression. There, is, there are uh, dissidents, opponents that are very brave and they are uh, um, repressed. But little by little, it's, they have changed. Previously, for example, they took in, in 2003, 75 persons to peaceful uh, people. To, to the jail uh, for 20, up to 28 years, some of them in prison. And now the, the prison terms are very short. They, they prevent you from doing a meeting or they take you some hours to a, sta a police station, but little by little, it's a, a little more open. Although it can close immediately and, and there could be a great repression. But well, I, I'm trying to summarize so much that uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Okay, okay. Well, th thank you for your opening remarks. Um, um, I have a couple of questions uh, before, before I hand it over to Tomas. Um, you talked a little bit about the Venezuela situation. It, is there an awareness or a feeling, a palpable feeling on the island uh, or concern regarding the economic situation in Venezuela? Well, uh, Raul Castro tried to, to he, he traveled, he tried to go to some other countries, friendly countries, to get uh, economic support, and, and, and he realized, I think, he realized that it, it, you have to pay, you have to uh, trade, you have to, uh, and, and he didn't get the support he wanted. And the people, the Cuban people, are very concerned. They, they're thinking that what happened in the 90s with the Soviet Union might happen now. And for instance, when Hugo Chavez was uh, dying, people in Cuba didn't say, oh, poor Chavez. No, all you heard, could hear was, oh my God, what is going to happen to us now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you and uh, Carl for hosting the event, for allowing uh, Medium to participate in your uh, program that has such great, uh, such great events. I w would be remiss if I didn't invoke the memory of Medium's late husband, Oscar Espinosa Chepe, who, if any of you had the honor to meet, was a wonderful, wonderful man who made amazing contributions to the study of Cuba's economy and uh, the push for human rights uh, in Cuba. So I wanted to, to mention uh, our good friend Oscar. Uh, Miriam, thank you for providing the perspective. I think it's, it, it highlights some of the, um, the economies that we deal with here in the United States, which is that uh, the Cuban government is in an economic situation where it feels forced to have to reform. In other words, its motivation for reforming is because it must improve the economic situation on the island to maintain leg legitimacy or to maintain political control. At the same time, it's implementing reforms, such as allowing self-employment, that let go of a little bit of that control. You mentioned that, um, that remittances and travel have been important to Cuba, yet in the United States there are those who charge, if Cuba is only reforming because of economic pressure, why should the U.S. help relieve that pressure by allowing money to go to Cuba? So I 
I was hoping you could address that issue and have a second question. <clears throat> well, I think that a, in the first place, you know, the Cuban government has always been uh, saying everything is because of the embargo, everything is because of the Americans. That people don't believe that. If, if, if it's been very a long time that people don't believe that. But anyway, imagine re receiving all the remittances and I don't know what percentage, but very high percentage of the Cuban population knows that their living, their, their quality of life is not so, so bad, although it's bad, because of what they're receiving from the United States, from their relatives. Uh, also, uh, this uh, money is used by the self-employed people. So businesses are opening more because of this, the more they receive, or not, not only um, money, but maybe if they receive a, a, some type of uh, equipment, and it could widen uh, 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 the, the possibilities. And, and there could be more and more of these independent businesses that make people uh, independent, that allows them to even, not only to be uh, independent from the, the government, but also to ask for more. The government opens a little and then make these restrictions and say, well, you have to pay this uh, high taxes, you can do this or that. And, but more and more, they're trying to, 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 to get that open. Besides, the government is going to, uh, has to unemploy a, a, around one million people because the, in the, in most of the enterprises are state owned. Where are they going to work? If they have possibilities to start their own businesses, small businesses, it, 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 it's wonderful for, for the Cuban population. And that, uh, the Cuban people feel that, they know that. Besides, well, of course, traveling and, and coming here is it, very important. And also Americans going to, United, to Cuba because it's this exchange of views. And if Americans would, were able to it also um, send or, or, or not only send because you're, you're helping and they're not going to pay any time. It, it, it could be loans or I don't know, different forms. This could not only open Cubans, a, a, a people, life and economy, but also their minds. And of course, the Cuban government is going to receive something from this. But I think that the, the main issue is how the society is opening, how the minds and the, 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 the possibilities of having another alternative to that of the government, it's of state-owned uh, property and society. It's very, very important, and, and, and you can see it, you can feel it everywhere. And that is why the, uh, Raul Castro and the, all the government is only trying to put a, a, a small reforms, because they know that this may um, endanger their power. And, and I think it's... You can feel it. It's not the same six years ago than what you can feel now. And besides, if one um, little business opens here, it has many people working for, to, you know, to supply, supply different uh, things for that business. So it, the, the, this uh, independent uh, economy is widening, it's opening. It's, it's well, that brings me to my second question, which is the constant debate here on whether or not there have been, quote, real changes in Cuba. You know, the, uh, Scott, in your book that you published, talks about Cuba's changes being few, late, and limited, and I think we can all agree with that. The debate here many times, or some would like to suggest that they're not, quote, real changes, meaning, for example, that the independent entrepreneurs aren't really independent because they are so beholden to taxes and licensing from the government. Can you talk about whether or not, especially when we're talking about the Cuenta Propistas, whether or not these changes that we've seen, including access to internet or travel, are real changes, or are they just cosmetic changes the Cuban government is doing to show a more positive face to foreign investors? <clears throat> well, the government started with these uh, cosmetic changes, but it, it's impossible, you know, to go back. And, and they tried, maybe they, they, they make a step, a step, and then they try to go back, but it's impossible to just to shut that or to liquidate that. It's impossible for them. It's limited. Uh, they're too late. Uh, Raul Castro said, "Well, we don't have to hurry." It, but in fact, they are losing. They are losing time. And if they don't do more in this now <clears throat> and this uh, next years, how would they maintain that power? What is going to happen? And we cannot lose these years 
because they're defining, this is a defining time, you know, for them and for all of us, for everyone who wants to help Cuba or who wants changes in Cuba. Of course, they, they are limited. They sometimes go back and, you know, back and forth. And because the, the government is trapped, they're trapped in, in their in capabilities, uh, the capability of the system, of their, their own, their minds, the, and, and, and their fear also. So it's time not to close, but to try to open. I have a follow-up question on human rights, but I thought we'd open up to uh, just, questions. Just first. one thing. There was a letter today that came out, an open letter to President Obama that uh, is signed by members of the public and private sector. Uh, you have uh, folks from the exile community. Andres Fanjul is on it. You have uh, John Negroponte, former uh, Deputy Secretary of State, former U.S. Senators uh, on this, uh, that actually is, is, is asking for reform in different areas, from travel uh, to increasing support for Cuban civil society, prioritizing principled engagement in areas of mutual interest. I guess that's person to people to people, or expanded people to people. What are your views on this? I know you guys are familiar with this. I, I think you're the leader of your organization is on it. Yeah, and we, and we played a role in this, so I, I don't want it to appear that this is a, a coordinated effort, but sure. it, it was com qu completely coincidental that Miriam happened to be here at the time, which is, I think, good because it gives us a perspective from at least one voice inside the island of uh, the question we asked earlier. If things are changing in Cuba and we think there's an opportunity, uh, should the United States act or do those steps like opponents would charge actually embolden the Cuban government? So maybe Miriam can speak to that. It's about the letter. <clears throat> no, I think it's uh, very positive to uh, try to, to, to interact more in, with Cuban people, to be there, to uh, be able to, to let, me, let me, because I don't remember sure. all the, the, the <clears throat> you know, to expand, for example, travels for more Americans to go there, to be able to, to grant loans also, uh, to, to increase the support. This is a, a way of increasing the support to, uh, to, uh, to civil society, and I, I've always, and my husband too, for many years, tried that Americans could go freely to Cuba, could travel freely to Cuba. That's very important. This exchange of, you know, between me, among people, it, it's very, very important. And of course, trying to uh, help in all this, uh, um, this would help a uh, private sector, uh, this would help the Cuban uh, society as a whole. And, and I think it's, it's had to, it's, it, it would be very positive, I think, all, all the things. Excellent. Um, I am going to open it up to, uh, for some questions. You can find the letter at www.supportcubancivilsociety.org, just in case folks are interested in it. Um, but I'm going to open it up uh, to questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, does, would anybody like to ask a question? Well, while you all think of what question <laughs> to ask, um, I'll do a follow-up question on human rights. Uh, <coughs> Miriam, yeah, we've seen reports <coughs> about the, uh, the number of arbitrary detentions of peaceful dissidents going up, um, about um, uh, you know, beatings or um, especially a lot of attention has been called to the detentions of the, uh, and the harassment on the ladies in white. Can you talk about the human rights situation? Why do you, do you perceive there's been an increase in repression? And if so, what do you think explains that increase? Well, uh, first of all, I um, can tell you that I, I'm no longer in Ladies in White. <clears throat> I was one of the founders, but I was in the Ladies in White until 2008. Uh, I have very good relations with them, but I'm not working with Ladies in White. I think that the repression has changed. Uh, some years ago, they would take you, uh, well, some years, very, uh, some time ago, they, they would even sh uh, shoot people, you know? And, but uh, afterwards, uh, they, they would take uh, for long-term uh, prison, uh, you had to serve long, long prison terms. Also, um, you could not meet, you know, if two or three people were going to meet, of course, the government knew that were opponents, so they, they were prevented from getting to that place. They they were maybe taken for longer terms uh, to the uh, police stations or not police station, but security police headquarters. That is, 
uh, very, very, uh, conditions very, very tough. And now, of course, they, there, is, there are more people openly uh, protesting or opponents, and, and the government tried to prevent this meeting. They are taken to police station most of the time, less and less to the headquarters of the security police, so that is the political police, and they are released. Sometimes they bring these uh, mobs that yell and they can even hurt someone, you know, in this struggle, or uh, simply uh, yell uh, uh, at the opponents that are um, very peaceful people, and, and we know that all those mobs are, are organized by the government. Everybody knows that. And uh, I think it's a, a different type of repression that, well, you, you, uh, Raul Castro has wanted to show that he isn't so repressive, it's not so strong, and it's in this, uh, let's say, a, a low, low um, uh, level. level. But it is there, it's maintained, and you cannot be confident that in any time this could change and there could be, uh, they could be very, very uh, harsh, very, very repressive, you know. So it's another way, because mostly because of international uh, uh, showing, show international. Uh, well, that, that brings me to my next question, which is on the um, European Union. Uh, Cuba is now in process of uh, dialogue with the European Union to um, replace the common position with a new type of policy. Can you comment on on that uh, dialogue? Well, I think it's positive because uh, the, uh, the the this um, position, the the common position of the European Union, uh, wasn't working. It, it was there. The Cuban government said uh, our relations with you is very bad because of this uh, position. Also, the, the 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 European Union supported the the opposition and and was very harsh on you know denouncing and. Um, regarding the Cuban government in 2003 when the crackdown. So the Cuban government simply cut the relations and, and it, they were very tense. Then it little by little improved um, after the, the uh, European Union uh, proposed, I think it was 2008, more or less, six and eight, uh, to, to re, um, ameliorate the, the, the relations. And um, what the Cuban government uh, uh, tried to, to obtain was a bilateral uh, agreements with the different countries. And this was a way also to um, um, harm this a common position. So I think it's important now there are 28 members of the, uh, the uh, European Union and around 17 have these bilateral agreements. So it's better for all of them to, to get together again and to have a common position towards the Cuban government. And of course, to be in Cuba. It's very bad not to be there and not to be able to know and to influence. The same, I think, regarding the United States. It's better to be there, to be able to interact with the, with the society, to have a, your, your interest there, your enterprises, a, and, and, and it's not only your benefit, it's that you're benefiting, benefiting the, the, the Cuban society. I think we have some tweeted questions here. Okay. Uh, from one of our Twitter followers, where does Cuba's youth fall politically? Do they support the Castros? Are they politically active? Where are the Cuban what? Youth. youth. Ah, youth. And oh, the Cuban. I'm sorry. What's the name? That's from a very brief. Okay. One of our Twitter <coughs> followers based in Cu the U.S. Okay. Cuba youth, most of Cuba, most Cuban people uh, were born after, 70% uh, were born after 59. Youth, don't be, they don't believe uh, what the Cuban government say, most of the, of the youth. And it's very sad that they want to leave the country because they don't see present or future in Cuba. Okay. Sir, if you could. Microphones. Yeah. If you could identify yourself, please, and your affiliation. Thank you. Orlando Luis Pardo Lazo, a blogger from La Habana. Uh, gracias por estar acá, Miriam y, y Tomás. Uh, one question, one point, uh, two possible scenarios. Do you, the, the rationale behind the fact that uh, economic uh, changes or investment in Cuba will lead to political op an opening or democratization in Cuba, the rationale behind this is 
that the investors are going to fool the Cuban government. So little by little, the Cuban government will do something that will somehow deconstruct the government, or the rationale behind this is the Cuban government is the only legitimate actor in Cuba now. There is no other actor, and therefore uh, we will recognize them de facto. No? So how do you consider both? Uh, Cuban investors can change Cuba. Cubans must change Cubans within the island. And the Cuban government is trying not to lose power. They've been on that for 56 years. And they will try to, to maintain power. But little by little, or as much as you can, uh, Cubans can do, and also the international community can help. But it depends on us, and of course, it's the same struggle. The Cuban government doesn't want to give up. And we have to, 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 to push the changes. Uh, quick question. So you've been able to come here. Ioanni Sanchez was here. Other folks have been able to get out of Cuba. We had Elizardo and Coco Farinas That's here right, at here at CSIS last year. Why? Why do you think that's happening now? Well, in the first place, I remember that in 1991, 1992, Raul Castro was, uh, again, was uh, also in a momentum, getting momentum, because there was a, this uh, economic and, and political uh, situation with the Soviet Union and all that. And he, at that time, he didn't say it publicly, but he had the idea to open, because he said, well, it, it doesn't have any sense to just to have problems, you know, international problems, mm -hmm. not letting these people go abroad, or Cubans go abroad. But it, he, he couldn't do that. Uh, I, I have a, an interview of one of his uh, more closest uh, aides at that time who spoke about that, about this opening. Mm -hmm. It was in 1991. So I think he, he's doing what he has thought for many years. It's useless to have this country close and having problems with the world, saying that this is a totalitarian regime and so on. So that is why I think he has opened the, the possibility of Cuba, Cuban traveling. That's for one thing. That's for the opposition, let's say. Let's let, let these people go, talk, uh, say what they think, or, and of course, let the others who support them or who sympathize or not with them to know them and to re decide. And <clears throat> but there is a, something very important. When Cubans get a visa, they, most of them try to stay abroad. And uh, the Cuban government has always used that as you know, uh, lowering the pressure, the social and political pressure. That was the Mariel and you know, other, other uh, great um, um, ex uh, exodus that, that the Cuban government provoked. Now they cannot do that. For many years they haven't been able to do that because of the helm burton uh, uh, law that says that uh, if there is another uh, exodus, uh, this would be considered as a, um, um, endangering the national security of the United States. Mm -hmm. So they, ha they, they haven't been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And also this opening could be a way to get rid of this pressure, I think. Mm -hmm. I think we have another tweet. Could you stand up and read it? We have a tweet from uh, Shot V. Uh, it's, what are the lessons to be learned from Cuba specifically for Venezuelans? What is to be learned? For Venezuelans. For Venezuelans, question. that they shouldn't uh, do what the Cuban people has done in the sense of believing uh, what this uh, type of government uh, says and that they should uh, struggle to maintain or to, to regain their democracy and, and, and be a, a, a normal society not imposed by, by the Cuban government uh, and this uh, Chavist uh, regime. Ma'am, if we can get a microphone up here. Hello, my name is Silvia Yusuf from the German Press Agency. Given that this is your first trip to Washington and you probably will meet, be meeting with authorities and congressmen eventually, I was wondering what is your main message? Do you know that many congressmen, senators are absolutely opposed to giving even an inch to Cuba? So how, how, how can you convince them to change their position? No, I, ca I can't convince them. 
uh, they've had this position for decades. I, I would like them, I, I respect them very much, and, but I, I think, and my husband and I have said this for a long time, <clears throat> that they could, should open more to know what is uh, happening in Cuba, how Cuban society has changed in the sense that these Cubans aren't the same as they were in 1959. There are different generations and different uh, realities. So I think that they should uh, be more open to, to, to what is needed right now. You're right here. You can get the microphone. <coughs> Uh, Mary Gunderson, Department of State. I wondered if you could comment about the Quintapopistas, if they've had successes in the economic um, realm there, being able to start out on their business, and especially what their biggest obstacles are to success. ¿Qué fue lo primero? Bueno, dice no. Esto, si han tenido éxito los Quintapopistas, ¿y cuáles son los obstáculos principales? Ah, there. And another question on that, uh, to add, what are the um, areas where you are seeing new employment? <clears throat> because at one point we had a lot of faladares, then there was a lot of taxis. Where do you see growth? Uh, so all these questions. Well, the cuenta propistas, uh, they, 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 it's very difficult because uh, the government opened um, to or allowed to, to work in some uh, fields, in some uh, things that are not those with, uh, that can really move the economy. The, the, let's say the macro economy in the, the, the country. And, uh, but it can help this uh, self-employed people to live a little better. When they, are, when they um, get more benefits, when they are successful, the government tries to, to, to not, for them not to, they say, not to get rich. And it's not a, a matter of ideology or a matter of, uh, of, of as, as the government says, principles, no, no. It's not, what they want is that people don't be independent, don't be uh, self, really self-employed in the sense that they would be able to have bigger businesses and to be more uh, independent from the government. Uh, and, and they're successful in, well, maybe in a restaurant and things like that, but you know, those, that, that, that doesn't make difference in, in the whole economy of the country. And, um, they are trying to, to get more openness, more, to work in, in more fields and more things. The government is trying to tie them by these cooperatives. Cooperatives, it, you know, it's, it's, they're fake. It's a, 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 a form of the government to tell them, you can do this, you can do that. Now with the new investment law, the government has said, well, even cooperatives might be allowed to uh, uh, work with the new investment, uh, foreign investors. Why? Because it's all going to be uh, state control. I think that the, the more they open, uh, the, the more that um, counter, uh, contra propista, this uh, self-employed uh, people, can open business, have more means. Cuba, imagine people don't have money, they don't have capital for, for opening. So that is important to get loans or to get, get assistance, to get equipment or to get whatever they need because that helps them not only to be, I don't know, a, a hairdresser, but to, to work in things that really make a difference for the country and for themselves, and to widen to, to the, the possibilities of, of uh, self-employment and, and, and a freedom. We have another tweet. Yes, uh, we have another question from a follower, uh, Abosio. Uh, he's asking, what was the impact of Sun Suneo? Uh, in the island? <laughs> I, I don't think it, there was any impact, really. Uh, uh, well, I didn't know anything about Sunsune until it was published by AP, I think, no? Yes. Uh, I've spoken with many, especially many young people, a lot of young people, and they said, well, I received this text, and they were, well, why did they say anything about it? It was only sports and news about, you know, uh, actors and things like that. But then I said, if they got political, what would you do? I said, oh, no, no, I would cut that. You know, because in Cuba, if you want to, to, to get anything, it's very difficult if you have political uh, 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 opinions. Yeah. 
university, a, a, a going abroad, because now you don't need a, a, an invitation or, or a, a permission, but you need a passport. Hmm? And if they say, we won't grant you the passport. Uh, so the government has always used some of this uh, mechanism uh, as a, 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 to, to repress people. And besides, imagine a society where money, the wages are, I don't know, $15 monthly, the, 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 the change. Uh, retirees also, I don't know, they don't get a wage of $20 and a, a, a pension of 15 <clears throat> People have to steal to sell in the black market. That's also a, a, a way that the government has used to um, have people, you know, not doing, not uh, politically uh, involved, not speaking out. And, and, and also, that has uh, made a, a great, uh, uh, it's been very bad for society because there is a great loss of values. So it's, it's very difficult for these young people to, or any, anybody in Cuba, to uh, get involved in political uh, affairs. They, they, they have to say, well, I don't mind. I want my country. I have, I, whatever I lose is better for my country. Mm -hmm. But it, it's very difficult to, to, to have support, uh, to, to support yourself, your, your family, uh, under the conditions that are in Cuba. We're getting a lot of tweeted questions is what I'm being told. But I'm going to let you guys have first dibs first, and then we'll get back to it. Sir, in the back here. You had a question, sir? Yeah, the microphone. Uh, thank you. I'm William Exantis from the Embassy of Haiti. And uh, <coughs> uh, I have uh, the privilege to serve in Cuba in 1998. And I arrived there um, uh, February 1990 in the midst of the special period. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about the, the economy uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the situation in Venezuela. And do you think, uh, mainly because of the situation going on in Venezuela right now, that uh, Cuba uh, is running the risk of uh, having another uh, special period? Is Cuba going to have another special period? That might happen. <laughs> the, 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 what is, you know, what has been discussed right now is how harsh it would be if it could be as it was with the Soviet, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed or, uh, or less. Some uh, very well-known economists say, no, it's not going to be so bad. But my husband and I, we, we, we don't think that it's going to be less. Maybe not, well, you can tell if it's going to be so prolonged, so long, but anyway, Imagine also that now, still, the Cuban economy hasn't got, gotten the, the level of 1989. Just that figure, about 30% still, or suppose it's less. If you don't have that level, and you don't have any resources, all the countries has been destroyed, is it, how is it going to be? We'll we have one more question. Tweet. Sure. Right, a tweet um, from at Silos, and he's asking if um, the Cuban doctors that are involved in the Mice Magicals program bring back a new perspective to Cuba that's promoting change. No, they don't bring back any any ideas of promoting changes because they want to uh, relieve their families' uh, problems, and they would like to go again abroad to work because. If they stay in Cuba, they will lack everything as they used to. And, and that's a great question. We actually uh, were asked to run a seminar on the Pacific Alliance in Wellington, New Zealand last week. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that was coming up with conversations with a lot of diplomats was, and the ambassador of Cuba was at this event, and we started learning about Cuban doctors in Samoa in the South Pacific, but also Cubans teaching English to aboriginals in Australia. How do Cubans on the island see this? Is it an overextension of funding that's necessary and talent that's necessary in the island? How do they look at these uh, efforts? 
Well, Cubans know that this is needed because the government doesn't have money and these people have also to live better. But also, Cubans are suffering that all the services are crumbling. There are no good doctors anymore. Sometimes if you go to this uh, small um, centers, uh, medical centers, there would be only a student, a, med a medicine student. And in, in the hospitals and, and other facilities, everything is, is very, very bad, you know? Also because the government can't, doesn't have money to invest. Sometimes you don't even have a, a Band-Aid, I don't think. Just to put you something uh, to, um, very basic. basic, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and that is the same in, in, in the case of education, the, there was such a crisis that Fidel Castro promoted with this uh, uh, taking um, secondary, you know, high school kids and making them teachers, and then all the education went even lower and lower and lower, that not, they, they are, uh, Raul Castro has, is working on this and has changed all this. No more students in the country field working. Uh, uh, these students that were, you know, teenagers, they, they're not, well, maybe they stay teaching, but they're not going to be new courses for them. And he's trying to, to, to make changes for uh, also, uh, Fidel Castro said, only um, university students. We have to have more graduates than everybody, anyone else in the world. That meant that you don't have, you know, the other uh, levels of uh, um, skill workers, for mm -hmm. example. There are no skilled workers in Cuba. So they realize that that is needed, mm -hmm. and especially now, suppose, you come, uh, uh, this foreign investor come, they want to, to, to uh, build a factory. Who are going to work there? They, uh, they have to bring all the materials, all the equipment, and besides, they need these uh, people who can work there. So now they're teaching uh, their, their courses, you know, they have programs for skilled workers or technical, you know, level, and, and but but be, that's what people feel mm -hmm. that everything is is being uh, harmed by uh, go, uh, those who had to go away. Yes. Marketa Bokova, Czech Embassy in the U.S. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. I have a quick question regarding the relations between Cuba and uh, Russia. The Russian foreign minister just visited Cuba and the region, so what's your view on that? Thank you. La relación de Cuba con Rusia. Con Rusia, que se hubo recientemente en el primer... Claro, sí. Eh, eh, no, el ministro de Relaciones Exteriores. Sí. Eh. Eh. Well, uh, yes, it was a surprise that Mr. Lavrov went to Cuba in the middle of the Ukrainian uh, crisis. And uh, imagine, uh, Cuba uh, was very close to the Soviet Union. Then it almost, well, they were, were very close with a, a cold with Russia. And then they started to, to get closer again. It's a matter of um, even personal identity. I think that Mr. Putin is very much like uh, Castro and, and all the Castros, you know. So, uh, I, I, of course, Russia needs uh, relations with those who are closest to them. So that, I think that's why um, Mr. Lavrov's uh, visit to Cuba was very symbolic, and maybe to other uh, countries, or other um, Latin American countries, was more because of uh, trade. Because of, although it is said, and I cannot uh, be certain about this, that again. They are moving in the military uh, front, let's say. Maybe uh, the Soviet chips uh, using Cuba again more and more. I don't know. This, is, this could be, but I don't know. That brings me to a follow-up question, which has to do with Cuba's designation again this year as a state sponsor of terror. Um, Carl actually hosted a very good discussion here at CSIS about that. And one of the things we've seen is year after year, the justification for Cuba's continued in inclement uh, seems to thin uh, to the point that this year, I believe the only mention was U.S. fugitives in Cuba and um, the presence of some members of ETA and FARC in Cuba, although 
apparently they're there without any objection from Colombia mm -hmm. or Spain. People like bringing up Cuba's um, inter, uh, interference in Venezuela, its relationship with bad actors like Iran or like Russia as just continued justification, the shipment of weapons to North Korea, even though they don't appear in the State Department um, justification. Can you talk about that designation, whether you think it's merited? I think that it's useless, <laughs> really. I, I think that it would be better if this uh, did exist because, you know, it, 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 it represents some um, closing for, uh, the, for Cuba to, um, to be in some international organizations and, and, and have uh, other relations with the American investors and, and trade and all that. And, and I think it's a two-way. It's, it's not that I want to benefit the Cuban government. It's that I think that all these institutions, all these uh, Americans should interact, should be uh, in Cuba. And uh, 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 this would be better for everyone, especially for Cubans, for, for not the government, for Cubans in, in, in the, the way they can even, for instance, uh, come to a, a, a training or a, a course to, in that sense. Because how could you say that the FARC, uh, Cuba is now sponsoring the FARC if they're in our talks uh, in, in Havana? Eh? And, and, and also, ETA is an agreement with the, um, the Spanish uh, government. And, all, and how many Americans are, are fugitives in Cuba? I don't think there are many. I think there are very few. So I think that it, everything has to move on, you know, mm -hmm. to move on. And, and, and isolation is air for a totalitarian regime, has been the air for all totalitarian regimes. They all want to be isolated, and that is very comfortable because they can do there whatever they please inside there. And especially in an island, we don't have borders with another country. We're absolutely close. Let me take one more tweeted question <coughs> before uh, we wrap up. This has been a very good session. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, your answers to the questions have been candid and thorough. So we, we really, really appreciate that. Uh, this is a question from Milo Prates. And uh, uh, he wants to ask you, how do you see the support for Cuba from other Latin American leaders at the last meeting of CELAC? <coughs> El apoyo de otros uh -huh. líderes uh -huh. latinos. Okay. Latinoamericanos. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, that. <laughs> well, um, although uh, the Cuban government is not what it used to be, it's not intervening and, and all that. And but anyway, it's better to be to have a, a, the Cuban government, uh, you know, uh, within an organization, and also a comp a compromised with helping a, a, a better a atmosphere in the continent. It's a, than to have it you know, free and intervening in what they think it's not going to be a, this uh, democratic or, or, or what, the, what Fidel, well, now Fidel Castro, but uh, what they usually you did. Um, also, of course, there is this, um, you know, there was this group of uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, Cuba, and Bolivia, all the time trying to um, impose their so-called socialism. And uh, there is another group, mainly Brazil, that is, well, I like Brazilians very much. But of course, Brazil has always had this uh, hope of being a, a, a power, and a, a, the main Latin American power. In fact, they're very powerful. And it's one of the emerging countries. So I think the, in these two ways, Brazil and some others had to um, uh, con you know, counteract the, the, the influence of this other group, the, ¿cómo se llama? The, uh, well, the, the name it has. So that, that, that is why they, they said, no, OK, um, you, union in, in diversity. Eh? Mm. You, you, let's unite in diversity. And, and, and it's a way. That is regarding uh, Latin America, let's say. But also, they had this situation that said, let's be a, an independent organization, no uh, OAS, no? Mm -hmm. And 
um, uh, United States and Canada uh, aside. And I think it's not only in a political sense or, or what it used to be, you know, this uh, Monroe Doctrine that Mr. Kerry talked about recently, uh, but uh, it's also because it's a way, you know, to say we are strong, we can uh, negotiate with you and in, in, in different terms. And also to get, get an international standard, you know, a higher level. I think it's a, quick, a, a, a bit complicated. I don't think it's so much that they want Raul Castro to be uh, recognized as, as the great president or the Cuban is leading the, the CELAC. CELAC is it's like say, it's not an, uh, an organization that it has this um, economic or trade, or it's, it's to, to bring about um, decisions, the mm -hmm. two, como de, de concertación. Consensus. Consensus. Consensus, Consensus, you know? Yeah. So they, there is a great propaganda, it's supposed to be something very important, but when something is happening, it's not the organization that is involved in, 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 in any conflict or any pro uh, problem in Latin America. Let's Before I go to Tomas to do the last question, if you'd like, I think we have one more tweet. Is it? Uh, we're all set with tweets, tweets? No more tweets? Okay, great. Tomas. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minia, my last question has to do with the third wor word that you guys used to describe changes. You said they were few, late, and limited, and I want to focus on the limited part. Um, some people say that the reason these reforms seem to go be half measures is because there's disagreement among Cuban leaders in the government whether they should go farther or whether they should uh, or they should not. And I recently heard a Cuban economist propose an alternative, which is that Cuban leaders are so afraid of failing in their reforms that they often pull back before they're allowed to fail. <laughs> and that failing is actually a great exercise that they should learn how to do. How, why, how do you explain the limited nature or the half nature of the reforms, especially if they're trying to achieve 6% growth or you know, 2.5 billions in foreign investment? First, they are afraid to lose power. Mm. Secondly, I think they don't know how to do it. They read, they discuss, they listen to others, but when they're going to bring about that, it's even the minds. Imagine a closed society, those are, even those people who are even next to Raul Castro, they don't know anything else. That's why they, they, maybe they've learned something in a trip, they've seen something. They have great limitations, hmm? great limitations in, 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 bring, in doing everything. And of course, there is also, they say, the hard, hard liners. Mm -hmm. Those are those, it's not Fidel Castro. Well, he's there, he might be intervening, but it's, it's all the people that have lived next to Fidel Castro and that, and that think we are going to lose something, whatever, or a lot. So of course there, 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 there must be a, a pressure from others that don't want changes because they are not capable of changing their minds or they are afraid. It's true, that can exist. But even those who are bringing about or are trying to, 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 to do something, they, they are very limited even in their minds. Thank you, Medium. Excellent. Um, I, I just want to thank you, Tomas, for bringing Medium to us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate your, your willingness to share. <laughs> uh, also, Medium, thank you so much for, for this wonderful session. I hope we uh, covered a broad uh, uh, group of questions, of topics. Uh -huh. Is there something else you'd yeah, like to I, say? I just wanted also to say thank you. And please, uh, uh, all that long name you have, Thank you very much for it, it but it's only medium labor. Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank. And thank you for having me here. Wonderful. I want to thank Tomas Bilbao and Medium Leiva uh, for okay, your time. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks.